It is always a great blessing to me to be able to attend this lectureship, not only to be able to speak, but to be able to attend it and to be able to sit at the feet of those who have worked very hard to put this material together. And I'm grateful for the elders of this good congregation for the leadership that they have shown through the years in the oversight of this valuable work in training men to preach the gospel. And I'm thankful for Brother Darty and the leadership that he manifested in the directorship as he directed it for a number of years and for Brother Cooper as he did the same, and now Andy as he is in that position. These are good men, but these are men, in my judgment, who are great men because they're servants and they understand what it takes to do that. And I know that I speak on behalf of others who are members of the faculty when I say that we're grateful for these, for the elders and these leaders that we have. In the historic Lyman Beecher lectures on preaching at the Divinity School of Yale University in 1931, George A. Buttrick said, and I quote, Apostolic preaching had but one word, Christ. And apostolic preaching linked to that word one overmastering objective, Christ crucified. Now, lest someone think that Buttrick was guilty of oversimplification. We set before us at this time what I believe is the authoritative source of that conclusion that he had drawn. And that's the passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, the first five verses. And I, brethren, when I came unto you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, proclaiming to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. What does this mean? Christ and him crucified. I want to set before you this morning this premise, this proposition, and that is Christ and him crucified is in a real sense, as you understand the meaning of it, the clue to the basic meaning of human life. that there is that real sense in which when we grasp what Paul meant, Christ and him crucified, that there is the sense in which all of the constituent elements that make up Christianity is seen in that. And that's what I wish to set out this morning. 
it would be helpful for us to observe on the one hand what is not meant by this. And there is material in the book that addresses that. Because of the constraints of time, I've decided to pass over that, except to simply mention, just in passing, that Christ and him crucified does not mean when Paul said, this is what I determined to know, nothing save Christ and him crucified, this does not mean Paul was unschooled. This does not mean Paul was unskilled. Unskilled in his ability to communicate the gospel. And that he gave little attention to that. I don't believe that. And I believe that we have set before you in the book some things to give thought to that will help us see that. And furthermore, it does not mean that Paul was unsound in his argumentation, that he would not have been concerned about setting forth the case for Christianity in a sound way. I think that is certainly implied that he was concerned about that in that masterful apologetic that we have in the 26th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. When he is arguing the case for Christ, as it were, before Agrippa and Festus, who had interrupted him and said that he was mad because of much learning, that he was insane, that it had gone to his head and he wasn't thinking right. And Paul responds to that saying, no, I'm speaking words of truth and rationality. Paul was concerned with the case being sound. And it was, and it is. So there are some things there that we need to understand. Paul was not saying when he said, I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. What does he mean? I like the observation of McGarvey and Pendleton when it is stated, he does not mean to say that every sermon was a description of the crucifixion of our Lord when he said, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. This is not to say that every presentation necessarily was some kind of a detailed description of that, but rather that all of his teaching and all of his preaching related to the atonement that was wrought by Christ on the cross. And then this observation here here is the foundation of the Christian system. Christ and the cross. There is the summation, as it were, of Christianity. The person of Jesus and his work, the very essence, the very center of the true Christian worldview. The pivot point, the very heart and soul of the gospel message. And I want us to see the, the essentiality and the undergirding nature, as it were, of this principle. And that is the foundation of divine revelation. That really is what we have in this early part of 1 Corinthians. That the wisdom of God is that which is revealed. That there is not any human save the one who took upon himself humanity and became a man, being God in the flesh. There is none of us that in and of himself can have or find the clue to the meaning of human life, to what it's all about. 
And so there is that passage in the book of Proverbs, where there is no vision, the people perish. And I've heard some really powerful sermons on how we need to be people of vision, and we do. But that's really not what that's about. Now, if you understand what the vision there is, that it's divine revelation, then I suppose you could take that and talk about our vision being conformed to God's vision, God's revelation. Certainly that's true. But where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint. One translation renders it, Proverbs 29, 18. I believe that a New Testament parallel to this is in the very section of Scripture where this expression is found, I determine not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. When Paul earlier had written, as it's recorded in verse 21 of chapter 1, since in the wisdom of God, the world by its wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of the message preached to save them that believe. You see, the world cannot reason its way as valuable as reason is. We cannot reason our way to what life is all about apart from a revelation from the Creator as to what it's all about. The message preached is the message or the word of the cross of Christ, he says in verse 18 of chapter 1, that again did not come merely through human wisdom, but by divine revelation. And so this statement, Underscore it. Allow the emphasis to be placed here. The foundation of divine revelation is the crucial key to discovering the clue to the meaning of human life. The foundation of divine revelation is the crucial key to discovering the clue to the meaning of human life. Because the way of man is not in himself. It's not in man that walks to direct his steps. There has to be something outside of ourselves that then we take within ourselves into the mind. It addresses the intelligence. It addresses, it addresses the mind. It also addresses the emotions and the will and the capacity that we have within us to think about God and to desire to be connected with God in the right way, to do the kinds of things that we ought to be doing to be right with God. In the two worldviews that Paul contrasts with the Christian worldview, in chapter 1, these two views being Judaism and Greek and Roman philosophy. You can take those two views... And as it were, there you have a kind of summation of the inadequacy of all of man's ways, his philosophies, and his religions. They cannot provide the ultimate answer. Now this parallel breaks down, certainly, at one point, and that is Judaism was revelation of God. But you see, it does not contain what it has to contain for us to be in that right relationship. It pointed to it, it foreshadowed it, it prophesied it, but it's not found there. And so it served its purpose. And it certainly is not found in Greek and Roman philosophy. And so here, as it were, is a kind of summation that it's not found in anything save, as Paul says in the text, Christ and Him crucified. That's where it is. Human philosophy and political action influential 
in the culture of the first century and how influential they were cannot solve the basic human problem. I found some interesting observations by Fetis in a brief uh, article titled Philosopher Kings. And he said, Plato and the philosophers who came after him thought that our biggest problem is ignorance and that if through education we develop the powers of human reason and condition people properly, our main personal problems would be solved. They also assume that the biggest problem with society is a lack of good government. And if society were governed well, our main social problems would be solved. But his observation is right on target when he goes on to say, no amount of reasoning and no amount of education, and I would insert in and of itself, can bring us back to God. No political system. No political system can take a wicked society and make it into a wonderful place to live. Because sin infects our individual character and our society so badly that nothing short of divine intervention can save individuals and change the world. And God has intervened, Paul says, through revelation. And ultimately... He has given the revelation of the person, Jesus. That's the ultimate revelation. And his work. And so we need not only human education. Certainly we need that. It's valuable. But we must have divine revelation. We need not only human politics, but we need the reign of God. God's wisdom comes to us in a revelation that human wisdom would consider foolish. Paul says that. And furthermore, God's power, think of this, God's power comes to us in an action that human politics would see as weakness, the cross. What kind of power is there in that? And of course, the world has gone way off target in its thinking to not see even the, in many cases, they deny even the very possibility of revelation. And so these two things, the wisdom of God coming to us in a revelation that human wisdom could, could not bring about and in fact even considers foolish. Some would even think it's nonsensical to even talk about it. Does this mean that Christianity is anti-education or anti-government? Not at all. But it does mean that education and government do not matter as much as Christ and him crucified, which is the summation of Christianity, which is the correct way to look at the world, to view yourself, your place in it, and what it's all about. The fact of the matter is, often education and government, as he observes, do more harm than good, apart from Christ. I remember Brother Nutter telling me when I shared with him I was going to go back to school, and and he sat me down on a pew similar to that in the Harmer Hill building, J.D., and he said, you remember there's one thing worse than a fool, and that's an educated fool. He was not opposed to education, but he was right on target, wasn't he? And you can see, I think, the the very epitome of that in Romans chapter 1, when they refused to have God in their knowledge and professing themselves to be wise, all the while doing that. And so government can rule well only if it honors the higher government of the king of kings and the lord of lords. There's been a lot of rhetoric thrown around, a lot of it last night. But I'll tell you this, this is not rhetoric. What this nation was built on with regard to its recognition of the value of the Christian faith. That's not just rhetoric. That's reality. And you and I need to think about that the next few days 
as we make our way to the voting booth. Christ and the cross reveal, I want to submit to you, five essentials. Five essentials for understanding the meaning of human life. Number one, the plight of humanity. Christ and the cross reveal the insufficiency of human knowledge, human goodness, and human effort. In and of itself, it's insufficient. Bales, in his little book, The Cross and the Church, says the cross shows that we're not sufficient in knowledge for the way of redemption through the cross is not the product of man's knowledge of the divine revelation. Man would like to think that he can merit the blessings of God, but the cross shows that man is not good enough of himself. No man has done all God required and has done it all of the time. If man is to be saved, it will not be through self-sufficiency, but through the renunciation of self-righteousness and the acceptance of God's mercy and the gift of his Son. Our Lord said, without me, you can do nothing. John 15, 5. And Paul, in writing to these same Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 3 and 5, said, not that we're sufficient of ourselves to think of anything, to think of anything as being of ourselves. Our sufficiency is of God. Of course, he said, connected certainly with what this is all about, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, Galatians 6 and 14, and the cross of Christ, I believe, has an infinite way, an infinite way of stripping the veneer of ultimate trust in human effort and knowledge and power and strength and righteousness, self-righteousness and, and goodness and manifesting ultimately that it is but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And so the plight of humanity is set before us, that we're in need. And I believe right-thinking people can, can sense that, that there is something more needed. And especially when you, when you understand through the revelation of God in creation what Paul talks about in Romans 1, that the invisible things of him from the creation are clearly seen, that, that it seems to be almost automatic that, that we are desirous of, of additional revelation. What is there? Has he spoken? What has he said? What am I to do? I, I have this sense of ought within me that says I ought to do some things, and ought not do other things. Where are the details of this? You don't find those details in creation. As wonderful as the revelation is in creation. That establishes his everlasting power and deity. And so it's found in divine revelation. Special revelation. The revelation in creation is certainly divine. God is revealing himself. But not in the sense of which we speak with this being God's special revelation. And so there is the plight of humanity, and then the price of sin is revealed. Because humanity cannot understand sin without a special revelation. Can it really understand very much about it? I would argue the case, without fear of anyone being able to successfully refute it, that there is something within right-thinking people that says, you know, certain things are right and certain things are wrong. <laughs> and I've had atheists try to take me down the street, which is dead end, <laughs> of saying, well, that's all just, you know, what you're taught. So be it, even if it is what you're taught. I was taught the multiplication tables <laughs> and sub subtraction and addition. Are you going to deny the reality of that, those kinds of things? The fact that something's taught doesn't diminish necessarily the reality of it. 
The fact is, it's not being taught the way it needs to be taught today. And yet at the same time, there seems to be something within us, like one young lady that I was in discussion with on this very point, she argued with me that, that God does not exist. And I said, can I just treat you any way I want to treat you? And she sort of bristled and said, why no, why not? She had no answer for that, no objective answer. And yet there was something within her that said, you know, this isn't right for him to just want to treat me any way he wants to treat me. But you see, this general revelation of God in conscience, in, in, in the world that we see within ourselves, you can't get away from God because you can't get away from yourself, for in him you live and move and have your very existence. But you see, that's limited. And so this special revelation, divine revelation, reveals the plight of humanity but the price of sin and taking it further over into Corinthians, which I believe Brother West will address this, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, 6 through 16. God revealing his mind to us on these things. More than four decades ago, I read for the first time a book of sermons that to this day remains in my judgment the best in that kind of literature that I've read. McGarvey's Sermons. Delivered in the summer of 1893 in Louisville, Kentucky, and published in December of that same year, containing numerous, numerous and extremely insightful statements, among which is the following concerning this very point, the price of sin. McGarvey said, and I quote, I wonder if any of us has ever realized what it is to commit sin. I believe that I would esteem above every other gift that could be bestowed upon me as a preacher the power to adequately conceive what sin is and to adequately set it before the people. He went on to say, a number of times in my ministrations I prepared sermons designed to set forth the enormity of sin, but I have every time felt that I made a failure. I found, I thought, two causes of the failure. First, a want of realization in my own soul of the enormity of it, and second, inability to gather up such words and figures of speech as would with anything like adequacy set it before my hearers. The pleasures of sin, he said, have blinded our eyes to its enormity. So I have come to the conclusion, McGarvey observed, after a great deal of reflection and a great deal of mental effort that about the only correct gauge we have with which to measure the enormity or the heinousness of sin is the punishment that God has decreed against it. And he went on to say, God is infinite in all of his attributes, infinite in mercy, infinite in love, infinite in compassion, and yet with his infinity with regard to these characteristics, he goes on to say, when we, find, when we find the punishment that such a God as that, infinite in love, infinite in mercy, infinite in compassion, we find that kind of punishment that he has revealed that he was constrained by the justice that also characterizes him to enact against sin. I think, McGarvey says, that we shall be better able to form an idea of sin's enormity than we can from any other view of the matter. And he's right. And when we understand, A, what it costs to get man out of it, and B, the price that will be paid if you live in it and die in it. Then you will see the true price of sin. I can't know that without divine revelation. There you see how divine revelation <laughs> undergirds this clue to the meaning of life and what life is all about, and the crucial questions that we have before us. And linked up with that is the passion of God. 
The cross is the revelation, Baal says, of God's love shattering the illusion that God does not care. The cross shouts in huge letters, God cares. Infinitely he cares. And it impacts an honest heart because it is the message of infinite compassion. This ardent love, this love of Christ for each one of us, vouchsafed and verified in his substitutionary death and in his glorious resurrection and his continual intercession, how it is the case that there is the sense in which his pierced hands can loose the cords that bind our souls to this earth. And because his love is fervent, conjoined with the hope of the resurrection, our hope is bright. And so Paul raises the question, what shall separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing, nothing, unless we allow it. Unless we allow it. And he's provided everything necessary to enable us to have the strength not to allow that to happen. Oh, the love of Christ that passes all human comprehension. And there is the power of God as another of these essentials. And Paul references that several times throughout these early sections of 1 Corinthians. The cross reveals the power of God as well as the wisdom of God. It's the revelation of divine power that unlocks the door to understanding the solution to the greatest human problems and questions. How is it that? No doubt among other things being the case, it includes these. It has the power to bear our sins. He bore our sins in his own body on the tree. I cannot do that. I cannot bear, I can't bear your sin. I can't even bear my own sin. I need help for that. And I find that. That's revealed to me. I didn't learn that in and of myself. That was revelation. My reasons involved as I'm confronted with that revelation. I have to determine whether it is revelation from God. And that's a whole other matter of establishing the Bible to be the word of God. But there is the power to bear our sins and the power to bind our broken hearts and to bring us hope in death. The cross of Christ retains through the centuries an unchanging, persistent power that transcends time, culture, and education, and science. These these good things, if handled properly, however, do not possess that power. And even if science and culture and secular education were able to usher in a good society in terms of well-clothed and well-housed and well-fed people, we would still be faced by deep problems of the human spirit. Again, Bales observes in his little book, The Cross and the Church. Oh, yes, science and technology can do some marvelous things. And we see and we're benefiting even this very moment from a number of those things, but they cannot take away the sin and the guilt that stains the soul of man. They cannot bind up a broken heart. They cannot take the gloom out of the grave. But Jesus can. And he does. I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Involved in that is this power, divine power revealed for us to learn what this is all about. And I want to conclude with this last one. The purpose of suffering. Some of the most crucial questions concerning the meaning of life and man's relationship to God relate to the issue of human suffering. Questions like, how can God be both good and just while allowing an innocent or righteous person to suffer? And can one know in view of even very intense suffering that there are good reasons for what happens in the world? Is all suffering the consequence of sin? What is God's solution to the problem of suffering? And that is answered ultimately in what this message is all about. That is God's 
solution. The cross and the things, the elements connected with it. Because you see, these questions and others like them are addressed at least implicitly time and time again in this special revelation. And we see it in a standout way, ultimately, in the person and the work of Jesus Christ, the supreme and final revelation of God to humans. Because this revelation makes it clear that suffering in the world is teleological. Teleological. That means it has purpose to it. There is a design to it. Just as the world itself. Paul references that in Romans 1. We look at the world and the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. There is design. There is purpose. And I deduce from that the ultimate designer. But within, you see, this scheme of things, there is suffering. And that suffering also is teleological is design. It has purpose. We do not know all the specific details of our lives, but we must trust God because of what we learn in his creation and in his word. And it is not, I want to emphasize, it is not that we cannot know anything. God does not call us to a blind trust. We must know, and we can know, one, that God is. And two, he can be trusted. I see evidence of that in the creation because the creation is not chaos. And that, it seems to me, is exactly what God was driving at, if you want to put it that way, with Job. When just one right after another in chapters 38, 39, 40, and 41 of Job, he asks him questions about the creation that he couldn't deal with, but splattered all over it was purpose and power and design and things that are so marvelous that we cannot fully comprehend them. But God can, and God's in control. And Job was questioning whether God was in control of his life. And God says, look, you can't even deal with all these great things in this revelation that you see out here and within yourself. Don't be too surprised. If you're going to have some questions concerning suffering, some details about it that you don't know the answer to. But you can and you should trust God when you cannot see the why of something has happened. And Brother Haley, I think, has an excellent observation on this when he says, we trust God because of, quote, the very evidence of purpose on the face of the universe. But beyond this teleological nature that is evident in the world, divine revelation has given us a supreme instance of purposeful suffering. Christ and him crucified. That's the supreme instance of suffering. And the cross reveals purpose in suffering. If you haven't gotten anything I've presented Zero in on this, please. And it'll help you every Lord's Day when you assemble around the table. The fact of the matter being that the cross reveals purpose in suffering by implying that if there is purpose, if there is purpose in the most intense, the most horrible, the most horrific, and the most agonizing instance of suffering, the cross of Jesus Christ, then it is possible for all lesser instances to be purposeful and to result in something good, though we may not know the details yet. Romans 8, 28. Paul argued this very implication revealed in the cross of Christ when he affirmed and he asked, he who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? So he argues from the greater to the lesser. The cross reveals purpose in all of suffering, no matter what happens to me in this world. By the cross, 
which is life's greatest plus sign, I am given the assurance that through it, the supreme instance of suffering and the empty tomb, which is the supreme victory, I can overcome any suffering, any suffering, by which I'm challenged in this life. Buttrick, in those lectures at Yale in 1931, included this. He said, the crucifixion becomes a clue. If God were good, says the world, the sin of the earth would break his heart. To which the preacher answers, pointing to Calvary, see his breaking heart. If this is a kind of universe with its griefs and its graves somehow necessary for our growth, then if God were good, he would at least share its pains with us, says the world. To which the preacher answers, pointing to that strange man on the cross, see God sharing our pains. And if God is God, the world says, then in compassion he will bear our sins as only God can. To which the preacher makes answer, behold him bearing our sins. Behold in Calvary a focus in time and space of that travail, which is the very thing revealed in Isaiah 53, which God bears from the foundation of the world. There in the cross is the clue which followed leads us to the assurance that the heart of life, however mysterious, is yet kind. Christ and him crucified, it is the person Christ and his work, the cross, that constitute a kind of summation of the gospel. The summation of Christianity revealed here once and for all. The wisdom of God, the power of God, the very heart and soul of the gospel, the crimson cord that binds all the constituent elements of the Christian faith together, the pivot point of Christianity, the cross, the foundation of revelation, revealing the plight of man, revealing the price of sin, revealing the passion of God, revealing the power of God, revealing purpose in suffering with Christ and him crucified, the burden of the burden can be lifted and the futility of life replaced by meaning and purpose through the message of the cross.